grace and peace to you and welcome to worship here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, whether you're watching us online or listening in on the radio. Um, this Wednesday, February the 17th is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent. We'll have a service here at the church outdoors at five o'clock. I hope that you can join us for that uh, special time of worship. And then um, through the weeks of Lent, uh, it's our tradition, tradition to study or to read together. And so this year we're looking at a book uh, that's got a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the front. It's called The Liturgy of the Ordinary. And the idea is that we can find God in all kinds of regular mundane kinds of ways. And I really look forward to reading this together. If you'd like to have some folks to um, share with and learn from, we'll be um, having groups that meet after the outdoor worship service starting next week. And then we'll also have an evening Zoom meeting and love for you to connect with us. Um, one last thing, you'll be getting a letter in the mail this week from our personnel committee and our associate pastor nominating committee. Uh, that letter will uh, share with you a few changes that we've got in some uh, personnel uh, here at the church, but also we'll ask for input from you uh, for our associate pastor nominating committee. We'd love to know about those things that, that, uh, that you love about the church and those things that you wish for the church as uh, we help them um, discern what God is calling us to in this season. So, so grateful for your uh, response to that survey. Um, now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God together. Our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 and 23 through 25. The message of the cross sounds foolish to the world, but to us it is the power of God. We proclaim the scandal of Christ crucified. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than our strength. In obedience to God's command to repent, let us lay before God and one another our need for forgiveness, that we might receive healing mercy. Let us pray. Merciful God, 
We confess that without you, we are not whole. Forgive our foolish ways. Reform our prideful selves. Make us listen to the way of peace. Remove from us the disbelief to which we cling. You are the one who liberates with a word and nourishes us with your own bruised body. Give us thankful hearts as we come before you now with trust and hope. Amen. The God who knows you through and through, whose own body and blood were given for your freedom, who calls you to renewal every day, hears your repentance and by grace has made you clean. I declare to you the forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Holy Trinity, one God, now and forever. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Today is Valentine's Day, the day we celebrate love. We give cards and we give candy. We give small gifts and we give extravagant gifts. But I think it's only fitting that we celebrate love right before Lent and Easter because the story of Jesus is the story of God's extravagant love for us, God's love for you and God's love for me. God's love isn't like ours. You see, in our imperfectness, we hold on to hate and we remember when someone has hurt us. I can still remember hurts from friends from when I was in elementary school. I can tell you names, exactly what they did to me, even if I haven't seen them in 25 years. But God's love is not like that. God's love is constant. God's love does not change. We may do wrong over and over again, but God still loves us. We may not remember to thank Him for all of our blessings, but God still loves us. We may fight with our siblings or disobey our parents, but God loves us. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and it marks the beginning of Lent. We remember that we are imperfect and that God is in control. We will spend the next 40 days remembering this, but at the end of Lent is Easter, the day where God took all of our flaws and replaced them with His love. Now, young families, don't forget to pick up your Lenten boxes. And for any grandparents that would like to share this with their grandchildren, we have some extra in the church office, but this is on a first-come, first-serve basis. After the worship video today, talk to your children about God's love and teach them how to show it back. Let us pray. Holy God, give us ears to hear that you, what you command so that ready to do as you desire, we may see your guidance and protection and come to love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from Psalms 50, verses 1 through 6. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around us. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that we may judge his people. Gather to me, my faithful ones, who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And our second reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Listen for God's word. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, But when the completeness comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to start with a real basic question. If someone were to ask you, why do you exist? What is the purpose for your life, and how do you know whether or not you're on the right track? What would you say? Well, the writers of Scripture would often talk about this subject. They would raise the question, what kind of person ought I to be? But the answers they gave were so complex, so obscure, so difficult to nail down that it's hard to say anything definitively, and I think you'll see what I mean. I'm going to walk through a number of statements from the Bible Somebody asked Jesus one time how to live the good life, and his response was, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When Jesus was telling his disciples how to live, he put it like this, a new command I give you, love one another. When Jesus told his disciples how they would be recognized as his followers, like what would their signature characteristic be? He said this, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the disciples was named John. John would later on write this, everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, because John recognized that this is a subtle and hard to understand point, he said it backwards too, just in case we're still confused. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And then things got really confusing. Another disciple named Peter came along. Peter saw things differently than John because Peter wrote stuff like, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And then there was Paul, who became a follower of Jesus after the resurrection, sometime after the other disciples. Apparently, he didn't get the memo because he wrote things like, make love your aim. And the goal of our instruction is love. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I know this is an incredibly complicated question. There's probably no way that we can sort through all these different perspectives to get at the root of what life was all about. But if you were going to try to say it in one word, if you wanted to give the Bible's answer to this question, what is life all about? What one word would that be? Let's try to say it out loud all together. It doesn't matter who you're watching this with. Life is all about love. It's all about love. 
Actually, it isn't rocket science after all. It turns out there really isn't any confusion about this at all. See, we live in a day and age that prizes success and achievement and advancement. And that's what the world tells us is what's most important. That's what we want our legacy to be all about. But the scriptures teach something very different. Over and over again in the Bible, there's one consistent answer to the question, what is life's purpose? Life is all about love. Spiritual maturity is measured by love. The gauge of a life well lived is one's ability to love. And so today, in the time that we have together, we're going to be talking about the most important topic in the world. It's about leading a life of love, and what an appropriate day to do so on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day won't fall on a Sunday again until 2027, so we want to take advantage of this day. A moment ago, we read from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the 13th chapter. This is one of the most familiar passages in all the Bible. You've likely heard these words at every uh, words read at every wedding you've ever been to. This is the love chapter. And I want to say something about the context of this pattern, uh, passage because it matters immensely to how we think about love and how we practice it. You need to know that the church in Corinth was a mess. Um, if you read chapter 12, the chapter that comes before this one, you'll see that it's all about conflict, people showing off, pride, arrogance, anger, quarreling, and fighting in the church. And then chapter 14, the chapter following, is about precisely the same stuff. Things are just a disaster. Now, in the middle of all this is chapter 13, and, and here's why that's important. It's not like Paul thought to himself, you know, I really ought to write something that couples can use years from now when they get married. And so I think I'll just wedge in a chapter that can be used at weddings. Um, that's not what's happening here. These beautiful words are often read at weddings, and that's a real appropriate thing to do. But you make no mistake, this is not a wedding passage. In fact, probably nobody needs to hear these words less than a couple getting married on their wedding day. After all, that's usually when we're at our best, right? So we have spent a small fortune making sure everything is perfect. Everybody's looking their best. Everybody's in a great mood. We're surrounded by friends and family. That's not the context of 1 Corinthians 13. This is a passage that is written to messy, difficult people who have messy, difficult relationships with each other and who have created a messy and difficult church. And it's in the midst of all this resentment and bitterness and envy and comparison and self-seeking that Paul writes these amazing words. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have faith to move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, if I give over my body but do not have love, I gain nothing. We might call this the mathematics of love. Paul says everything minus love equals nothing. You can do great things. You can accomplish all that you had hoped for and more. But if you do it without love, it amounts to nothing. In the final equation, you've got a big zero, a goose egg. Paul goes on to give the greatest description of love that's ever been written down. This passage is full of powerful and penetrating ideas, and we don't have time to unpack everything in our time together at this point, but I do want to point out just one thing. Do you find it interesting that the first thing Paul says about love is that it's patient? 
Anybody feeling like their patience is at an all-time low? Um, for some reason, maybe it's because we're feeling kind of cooped up. Maybe it's because we're not able to do many of the things that we want to do. For whatever the reason, it seems like people are ready to snap at each other over the smallest thing, over the tiniest infraction. Friends, love doesn't do that. Love is patient. And I wish we could go through these line by line, but like I said, there just isn't time today. So I hope you will read this passage again when you get home. Perhaps you'll do that every day this week. Just meditate on these wise and wonderful words. I want to kind of wrap up our time together with a simple thought. And... Um, the great thing about showing love is that you don't need anything in order to do it. You don't need an education. You don't need a resume. You don't need a title. You don't need money. This opportunity um, lies before all of us. See, it's easy to go through life and get discouraged. And we get torn up over those things that we hope we would be able to achieve, but we weren't able to achieve them. And we beat ourselves up because we couldn't quite climb high enough on the ladder of success. And I want to tell you that's not how love works. Love is available to anybody, anywhere, and at any time. No matter what your circumstance, you can choose to live a life of love. So there's, reason, there's no reason not to do it. And if you want a good place to start, here's just one idea. Would you write down a positive characteristic about yourself? This will help you to be grateful to God for God's love towards you. And then write down one positive characteristic about another person. And then... Um, you want to share that with that person. It could be their helpful attitude or their desire to serve or their sense of humor or how smart they are or the fact that you just like to be around them. And then when you're with that person, if you'll look them in the eye, you'll notice them, you'll listen to them. And then in an appropriate way, you express your appreciation in a really straightforward uh, kind of honest way. Now, this is going to be easier to do for some people than for others, of course. And you already know who I'm talking about. There's already a name that has come to your mind. There's a person in your life who just doesn't get it. Uh, someone who thinks the world revolves around them. One who does something um, to annoy you in some way. Somebody who belongs, belongs to the wrong political party or whatever it may be. So what do you do with those difficult people in your life, those people who are just harder for you to be around? Well, you're going to need God's help. And so you ask God for a sense of gratitude and admiration. And God will help you with that. He really will. And I decided this week to try to put this experiment into practice, just showing appreciation to other people. And so I decided that I was going to compliment three people during the day, and I was going to do that with purpose and with intention. I decided that I would space those compliments out during the day, one early in the morning, one kind of in the middle of the day, and then one in the afternoon. So I came into the office and I started the experiment. I did it with just the first person that I saw. Um, just paid attention to that person and uh, spoke words of appreciation to them. And by the time that I was done, that guy that I was speaking to had a smile on his face and he just uh, seemed to be standing a little taller. And it was so much fun, I couldn't wait to do it again at lunchtime. And so I did it again. And again, that person left that interaction seemingly a little more alive, even with a, a bit of a spring in their step. And then I did it one more time in the afternoon, and, and the same thing happened, and it was just so great. Um, at the end of the day, I was packing up things to go home uh, for the night, and out in the hallway, I could, I could hear a group of people talking. 
And I wondered, should I show love a fourth time? And honestly, I wasn't sure. After all, I had already reached my love quota for the day. And I didn't want to overshoot, like on my very first outing, as meaningful as the experiment had been. I didn't want to go crazy with the whole thing. So I thought maybe I would just wait and get to them tomorrow. But then I decided to go ahead with it anyway. And I got up from my desk, went over to this group, and gave compliments to four people uh, who were gathered there. And it was just so much fun, just indiscriminate, out of control blessing. And it felt so good. See, that's the amazing thing about showing love. I was trying to show love in order to bring joy, but it turns out I was the happiest one of all. And all of a sudden, I wasn't so preoccupied with those things that I had to accomplish or I had to do. I wasn't um, as worried with solving uh, those problems that were before me or meeting those deadlines, just enjoying loving people as best I could. Friends, love is the reason that we are here. It's the reason we exist as, as a church. It's not about buildings. It's not about programs. It's not even about getting people's theology exactly right. It's all about love. I came across this quote the other day. I'm not sure who to attribute it to, but it goes like this. No one who succeeds at love fails at life. And nobody who fails at love succeeds at life. And by the way, this is a kingdom principle. This is what a life in the kingdom is all about. This is that most excellent way of kingdom living. And frankly, it's available to anybody who wants it. Let us pray. So God, would you make the reality of your love for us so powerful that nobody would leave this place without knowing that they are truly loved by you. And in that knowledge, may we live a life defined by love for others as well. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. And now let us affirm what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us take our joys and concerns to God in prayer. Living God, you have poured out your love upon us. You have granted us your blessing and peace. So now give us the courage and the confidence to love one another and to go wherever it is that you call us to go. And now hear the prayers of our heart for your church in the world. Make your church secure upon the foundation of Christ and bring us to unity of mission for the sake of the gospel. Lord, let your church be a living sign of the resurrected Christ, sharing the gift of forgiveness and the gospel of reconciliation, and most of all, the good news of your love. We pray for the world and for its leaders. Uphold the leaders of governments who work for peace. Especially, we lift up our president, our Congress, our governor, our mayor, our city council. Provoke the hearts of our leaders to compassion and make them agents of reconciling justice among your people. We pray too for the poor, assist those in need and make your church a refuge for those in want. We pray for the sick and those in distress, heal those who are sick in body or mind or spirit Comfort them in their pain and restore them, we pray, to wholeness of life. We pray for our neighbors. Bless those who live in our community. Strengthen our goodwill. Let us dwell in harmony, we pray. We pray for our enemies as well. Bless those who hate us. Give us the courage to refuse retaliation. Make us instruments of your reconciling love. These prayers we offer through Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now hear us as we join our hearts and voices together, praying as our Savior taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, let us respond to God's loving presence in our lives as we offer our tithes and offerings this week, seeking to serve those both near and far. On this Valentine's Sunday we are reminded of our most important reason for being the purpose of our lives as sons and daughters of the King. And that is to lead lives of love. And now as this service ends, go with God's blessing and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen.